Okay, so today we have Dr. Zayed Hamadi from Southampton, in the UK. This is, I think, the third or fourth time you join us. Thank you very much, Hisham, and thank you very much, everybody, for attending. It's nice to nice to meet you again, and inshallah, we'll meet you again and again in the future. And uh, we look forward to meet you somewhere in uh, uh, in a couple of years' time, where hopefully the BASO and SO meetings they will be joined together. In Birmingham, there is some kind of an agreement, but hasn't been announced yet. So, inshallah, we'll see you all together. Okay. So, I, as the Hisham said, I, I am based in Southampton, and um, uh, my main work, day work, is really pancreatic and liver surgery. And I only do liver and pancreatic cancer, uh, about 99% of my work, benign work, is, it comes really in very minimal uh, proportion. So over the next few minutes, I'll be talking about uh, mainly focusing on Whipple's procedure and the approach evidence based behind uh, different controversial issues in Whipple's procedure and pancreas cardiogenectomy. Uh, I'm not going to focus on distal pancreas here. Um, uh, and starting with some kind of uh, technical aspects and then perioperative care and then moving on to uh, modernization of the, or the new techniques where a robotic procedure can uh, be taking place, which, uh, and then we'll talk about what's the pros and cons. Uh, obviously, I'm sure you all know that there are different approaches for pancreatic surgery. People, they use, still use midline approach or transverse approach rooftop. Some other people, they may use J incision, similar to the way that they use it for the liver. Uh, the section didn't take any precedence and didn't take really um, uh, uh, popularity. Um, I couldn't find any uh, sort of evidence-based approach to compare the two incisions. However, the only approach, the only um, the only evidence I found was comparing longitudinal with transverse incision in vascular surgery with triple A repair. And it showed that transverse incision has got significantly less pain control issue following surgery. In addition, there could be difference in incisional hernia postoperatively. And as you all know, you all know, after the incision, the main technique will be mobilization, traditional mobilization, hepatic flexure, until you see the vena cava and the left hepatic uh, left renal vein. And then uh, we assess the uh, relationship of the tumor to the SNA. Uh, where uh, operability can be decided. I've never had such a decision really in theater over the last uh, seven uh, years um, uh, to decide whether it's operable or not operable by that approach. Usually, uh, preoperative imaging will be much, uh, uh, give much better clarity rather than finger feeling. And obviously, mobilization of the biliary structures thereafter forming the PV tunnel, and I would consider this uh, a part of the, the formation of the PV tunnel is quite important because if you are unable to, to form the, panel, uh, the tunnel, then here you need to think about uh, venous resection. And if you're not prepared for that, you may need to consider that this is inoperable at that stage. And therefore the tunnel formation is quite a critical step to decide operability. And usually I would advise to do that at an earlier stage before you starting to make uh, the section and the decision will be irreversible at that point. And obviously the classical approach will be the portal vein clearance. And thereafter you go to the SNA and the posterior margin as in this uh, case here, you can see the portal vein has been nicely exposed. The bile duct is being clamped so that we don't get lots of bile contamination around. The vena cava and the hepatic artery uh, well seen. It is my, uh, standard practice that I encircle the SM, uh, the SMV. I don't encircle the splenic vein or the portal, but uh, the reason I do that, because quite often you, you can get injury to the uh, portal vein uh, where you need control. And if you are in control of the SMV, controlling the splenic and the portal vein is much easier and make control of any bleeding immediately much easier as well. However, artery first approach has been proposed over the last uh, 15 years. And you can have different approaches for artery first approach. You can have either caudal approach or uh, inferior approach. 
Um, main reason I would use personally in my practice the artery first approach when I'm contemplating venous resection. Um, apart from the or, I have got some doubt about the integrity of the venous uh, contact with the tumor. Apart from that, uh, the only advantage of the artery first approach is it may reduce the bleeding uh, from the specimen because of less congestion to the specimen while we're dissecting. People, they advocate that the artery first approach can give you a better margin. I don't think there is any uh, uh, first class evidence to support that. And this is where an artery first approach that I have used, you can see here, the hepatic artery has been exposed, the portal vein, and the tumor is still attached to the vein where the vein is being pinched. You see that's the tumor in my hand, and that's the SMV and that's the SMA. The, so the SMA has been completely stripped and cleared from the posterior, while the, the, the tumor itself is still hanged uh, within the vein. And after this step, I'll put clamp around the SMV, the portal vein, and then start to dissect uh, a little bit more and then take, uh, uh, usually I will take um, a circumferential resection of the vein. I don't usually do, I try not to do, I, not, not, I don't say I don't do, but I try not to do a wedge resection. I try to do uh, a proper end-to-end -end anastomosis. It always gives a better um, a caliber of the, of the vein after the section. And this is the same vein after it's been cleared. You can see here that thread, the, um, the proline suture, where the uh, vein has been transected and reanastomosed. And then you can see the artery, that's the margin of the artery, and the lymph nodes, the celiac lymph nodes at that stage here. Uh, so, it is safe, yes. Uh, I think we agree it's safe. It may be associated with slightly um, uh, more aggressive approach, slightly. Uh, you, can, you can have some feeling there is some in danger to the SMA when you do that approach, particularly if you become aggressive with the, with, the, with, the, with the artery itself. And as I said, that should be considered when there is threatening of the SMV or portal vein and when you are, when you are contemplating venous resection. However, uh, there is, as far as I know, there is no proven uh, difference in margin, lymph nodes retrieval and survival. Some people, they advocate that you can have a better retrieval of lymph nodes compared to the traditional approach. This is another case where an artery first approach has been uh, done and both the portal vein, SMV, and the splenic vein has been encircled and the vein has been resected circumferentially and reanastomosed in place. Um, we know now from our experience and from the literature that artery, uh, uh, ven sorry, venous resection should not affect perioperative mortality um, uh, and should not affect morbidity as well. We try to be very selective for people who we uh, consider. Uh, so by the way, just to let you know that these are not our figures in Southampton. The mortality from the Whipples in Southampton is 1.7%. And uh, this has been improved over the last five years. I can, I can tell you that we have only two people died from pancreatic cancer resection after uh, 300 resections. So collectively over the last 10 years, our mortality is 1.7%. Uh, morbidity, almost similar figure to that. What we've got is about 30, between 30 and 40 uh, percent morbidity. We are very rigorous in recording our morbidity, and we do have a monthly meeting where we even record. So we have got a specialist nurse appointed to record any single readmission, any single complication. So I will tell you that after Whipple's procedure, if somebody has developed a white cell count and CRP elevated and we started him on antibiotics, this would have been considered a morbidity and complication, regardless whether we found the source of infection or not. If we started on antibiotics, then as you know, with the clavindo, ginger clavindo uh, classification, we would consider that as grade one, two uh, complication. So we, have, we are very rigorous, actually. We recorded, sometimes we feel crazy about ourselves because we recorded two uh, too, too many complications. 
But this is my feeling is that this is the only way that you can review your practice and re uh, judge your approach to deal with these patients. Um, so the, does it improve overall survival with SNV compared uh, if you don't do vein resection? Of course, when you do a vein resection, um, logically you're dealing with more aggressive tumor and the literature shows that the mortality is slightly higher. I mean, long-term long survival is slightly higher when do the vein resection, but this is in general reflecting the uh, aggressiveness of the tumor itself. And although a SAC-5 trial has finished recruiting and it's been presented at the ASCO meeting a couple of years ago with some partial benefit to neoadjuvant approach chemotherapy, it hasn't been published to my knowledge till today. The, uh, where we discuss the R positivity for pancreatic tumor, we usually ask pathologists to clarify when they say it's R positive, where is the R positivity? And particularly after vein resection, because you've got, it could be positive at the pancreatic resection margin, it could be positive at the posterior margin or at the vein margin. However, the vein margin positivity is quite different if it's positive at this side or this side, because you've already resected the vein. And if the vein is positive, at the site where it's contacting the pancreatic uh, uh, parenchyma, then this is it's unlikely to have any significant clinical effect because literally you have grossly actually resected the tumor itself. And recently we have analyzed this approach and we've proven that actually when it is a positive at the lateral aspect of the vein, the survival is improved compared to uh, if it's positive to the medial aspect of the vein. It's not been published uh, yet, but it's on its way to be published soon. So what we do, Whipples, classic Whipples, or PPPD, really, we are divided between ourselves as well. And I, I, don't, I have, can't remember that I went to any center in uh, Britain where everybody does the same. Uh, in general, uh, I would say that if the patient is young and uh, if I'm expecting that the patient will have a good outcome with a long-term survival, then I prefer to do PPPD. Uh, if it is, uh, uh, if I don't think otherwise, I will do classic whipples. Is there evidence behind that? Which one is better? There isn't. Uh, the the meta-analysis didn't show that uh, the uh, pancreatic fistula rate has been improved neither it has shown that the delayed gastric emptying has been improved or quality of life. And this is the reason uh, when, when you say about quality of life not being improved, but doesn't mean that it hasn't significantly improved. The reason is if you think about it physiologically and logically, if you preserve the um, uh, uh, pylorus, then you are preventing the reflux of the bile and pancreatic juice to the stomach. So physiologically and logically, that may give you a better a sense that you are improving the quality of life. I wish I can see some future literature to say that there is an improvement, in, indeed an improvement in quality of life with PPPD uh, versus Whipple's. Um, right, uh, I don't know which way you do it. I do the Blumgarten stenosis. And um, really, I would say, Yes, I prefer it, and I think this is the best way to do it. But I'm sure many other people, they do different anastomosis, the classic cattle warren anastomosis modified, and uh, the Duncan anastomosis. There is, there, there is a trial which compared the Blumgart anastomosis, uh, which has been done by the Liverpool team, uh, but they haven't shown that there is a significant difference in outcome. However, most people who have done the Blumgart anastomosis that I spoke to, we feel that it's easy, uh, repetable, and can be done in any situation where they, they've got a good pancreatic parenchyma, bad pancreatic parenchyma, and to be quite honest, our leak rate from the uh, Blumgart anastomosis is almost 5%, which is quite good. So it all depends on the duct size, pancreatic texture, and the blood supply, and of course, the uh, most important other factor which is the margin between the pancreatic uh, 
uh, resection and the free uh, uh, sites. PJ or PG. Um, I know only of one center in the in Britain they do PG. Um, Although there's, there's some evidence to suggest that PG is better than PJ, but we haven't leaned at all towards PJ. I know in Europe there is some kind of um, uh, skewness towards the PJ, uh, claiming that the uh, pancreatic fistula rate has been improved. And in addition, uh, uh, they, may, they may have better quality of life as well. Uh, technically, we haven't uh, used this approach. Uh, but still, our our results actually shows that we have got a good uh, good good outcome in particular with uh, postoperative pancreatic fistula. And I'm sure you all discussed between between yourself whether you want to put a stent for with pancreatic anastomosis or you don't put stent. Uh, I personally do use a stent regularly. I do use the internal approach internal stent, external stent is being used again in one single center in Britain, um, and they stopped to, uh, as far as I know at the moment, um, claiming that external stent, when there is a leak, it's better controlled than the internal stent. Uh, we know that from the literature, putting a stent or not putting a stent at all does not affect the pancreatic fistula rate. But my personal feeling is that the stent helps you to guide your needle and it's only for technical reasons. I don't stitch the stent, I just leave it floating, therefore you will find all my stents will come out uh, and reasonably within a time after the surgery itself. So these are uh, what I found are five uh, randomized trials comparing stents versus no stents, and as I said, there's no difference in the outcome uh, or, or reduced pancreatic fistula rate. It's important that you adapt regardless of what you want to use in terms of uh, reporting your pancreatic anastomosis technique. And it's important uh, to agree within your colleagues what do you mean by a normal pancreas, soft pancreas, hard pancreas? Do you want to take any uh, action? Do you want to take any recording from the pathologist about the fat content of the pancreas? Because we've noted in the past that when the pancreas has got a lot of fat because it's inside it, the fistula rate increases. And as well, duct size. We all estimate duct size. I've never seen any center. Went few centers around in the state, in New York. I've never seen anybody who will measure it like with a caliber, or oh, this is two millimeter, three millimeter. We all, all so, sort of estimate it. And the best way to estimate it is when you put the feeding tube or the stent. You know these, the, the stent comes in different sizes, and you will be able to estimate the size of the duct. But it's important for your auditing purposes to record the uh, type of the anastomosis, the duct size, the uh, parenchyma of the pancreas, and as well the pancreatic feminine distance from the margin. Well, usually I use the, at the very least one centimeter. I prefer one to two centimeter to avoid any kind um, uh, of uh, gaping between the pancreas and the uh, chitinal anastomosis. Uh, there are various other uh, parameters that you want to record. For example, uh, if you want to, uh, of course, you have to record PG, PJ, but as I said, we uh, routinely and religiously, we use the PJ. We have bought a system where we record ductal mucosa, ductal anastomosis, and we report, we report every single stent that has been used. So that will facilitate auditing process and as well as the suture material that has been used. Um, I'm sure there are other people who will use rune wine anastomosis uh, to connect the bowel together. Uh, I don't believe that there is any benefit from that. Um, um, you may use it, but it takes longer. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't affect me, the patient nutritionally. Uh, people they claim that if there is a leak, then they can't feed the patient after a leak. We don't. We didn't find any difference usually and uh, uh, universally. We, we, we never use the root uh, and wide uh, anastomosis. And again, it's important question whether you use, um, uh, you, you leave an NJ feeding tube intraoperatively or you don't. Um, uh, there are some studies which suggest leaving an NJ feeding tube may be associated with slightly higher complication rate. Um, 
and uh, in the un in our unit where we adopted the protocol that if we don't if we are unable to start the patient with a normal feeding after a week from surgery then parental nutrition will be started now there is there are many arguments against what we do of course but when you've got a protocol that's been established in your unit and you've got a good parental nutrition team will support you with a low infection rate in lines and good outcome, then you'll start to avoid deviating it. I personally, I don't think there is anything wrong by using the regular deviated nasal jejunal feeding tube, but it's important to agree with your colleague with a protocol, uh, whether you use it or you don't use it and make sure that you report all the complications. We have uh, reported some cases in, in, in Britain where patients, they have died from complications from NJ uh, tube inserted uh, during surgery. Uh, I think it was bowel, bowel perforation at that time, a few cases in the north. Um, uh, and the other thing is if it had, if the patient had just delayed just with emptying and he vomited, usually uh, with vomiting, the NJ feeding tube will be dislodged and will disturb all your program. Uh, and therefore, we you go to square one where you need to insert another NG feeding tube. We know that there is no difference in infection rate. Um, and the best way is that you wait for the patient to establish his oral intake, usually in our protocol with enhanced recovery program. Day three, they have got a free fluid being insert, uh, started. By day five, you, they are able usually to drink supplements, drink. Day six, they are eating uh, soft diet. Um, very, uh, I, I believe that everybody will be using octreotide injections intraoperatively. Now there are a couple of trials which support their use for seven days. Beyond seven days, nobody supports it. We usually uh, stop it. Um, does it reduce the pancreatic fistula? Yes, all over, all over pancreatic fistula rate may be reduced. However, the clinically significant fistula that doesn't reduce and uh, as well, it does not affect the mortality. So perioperative mortality is not affected. So our usual protocol currently is uh, 100 microgram three times a day for uh, six to seven days. And our uh, length of stay in hospital length of stay is eight days. So my median length of stay in hospital is exactly eight days. We found it very difficult. So we're starting, I, I don't know whether you know or not, we started currently the robotic program uh, just a couple of months ago, and we are, uh, we are finding it very difficult to fight with the management to convince them that this will reduce the length of stay. Because if you've got an open pancreatic progenectomy with a length of stay of eight days, you need to propose another length of stay for a robotic program. And you can't propose that patient that proposal they will go on in five days' time. I hope so. I hope so. But this is that what we found it is very challenging to 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 uh, to prove our case with the uh, uh, with the management. And as you know uh, from the uh, Kevin Collins study uh, back in 10, 15 years ago, whether they use brain or they don't use brain, the only center I've, I've really seen in in the state. Uh, where they don't use drain is the MSKCC. And they, they, don't, they still don't use drain up until today, as far as I know, they don't. But there are a few trials that came afterwards which um, uh, refuted uh, this initial study. And in general, we don't have complications from drain. We don't, I don't think that increases the risk of infection as being proposed in the trial. And universally has not been accepted as standard practice or approach for not using drain. We will not be able to defend ourselves if we don't we don't use drains for these patients. But in general, drains will be five, after five days, usually five days, the drains will be removed. Aggressive resection. You we all would like to do an aggressive resection, but really pancreatic cancer, you need to consider the, the nature of disease itself. It is a, an aggressive disease. Yes, when you have pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor you will be able to do circumferential resection surrounded uh, uh, the, the vein and the artery, uh, like this ugly tumor, which uh, the patient, young patient presented with jaundice and has uh, got 
the, 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 the tumor itself is encircled the vein completely and the artery completely, and therefore we have to do a really complete a triangle, um, uh, the, the new policy of tri the new term of triangle approach, where we have this dissected all around the SMA. And now, unfortunately, I can tell you that by doing that, you are denervating the bowel. Eventually, the patient has been having bowel motion uh, 10 times a day. I can't remember now how much does he take of antidiarrheal medications. Uh, the loperamide is on 16, 17 tablets a day, in addition to codeine. So the quality of life of this approach is significantly worse than people they may say, why are we doing this? However, for this kind of tumor where you have got a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor and was grade two, the patient uh, got the benefit uh, of, of removing the tumor and he is still surviving for uh, 10 years following this procedure. And that you can see that the, the portal vein site uh, has been completely encircled around uh, within the tumor when the, 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 uh, the tumor is being removed and resected. Enhanced recovery in HPV we, um, has been late in development of the enhanced recovery compared to our colorectal colleagues. And the reason because of the nature of the pancreatic uh, surgery, we have a better outcome with enhanced recovery after liver surgery compared to pancreatic surgery, which has been a little bit more challenging to develop it. And the main reason is that enhanced recovery doesn't start, it's not a recovery basically, it needs to start from day one when you see the patients, you prepare the patients, give them, and we currently have uh, adopted what we call it a school of surgery exercise, where the patient is be, will be given a booklet to increase their exercise tolerance and they um, uh, get a watched or supervised exercise by attending the hospital once uh, for two weeks, uh, once a week for two weeks before surgery, where they do put on a bike to be trained and make sure that they do actually half an hour of uh, cycling and then uh, thereafter they we measure their uh, ventilatory thresholds. It has been adopted by our cancer alliance where it's been supported to be used universally for all cancers, not only pancreatic cancer, uh, or esophageal cancer, and I'm sure it will take its precedence uh, nationally where a lot of people they started to uh, consider school of surgery approach uh, to improve the postoperative outcome. Um, what we, how we measure the uh, evidence that enhanced recovery is improved or not. Yes, we always measure it by length of stay, but actually it isn't just length of stay, it's the, it's the quality of life. And when you improve your patient's quality of life preoperatively, eventually you will get better patients, smiley patients postoperatively as well. So it's shown that when you adapt the uh, enhanced recovery in HPV uh, surgery, uh, it is not inferior to a conventional approach and actually the outcome uh, in general outcome uh, and, and complication rate is significantly reduced with enhanced recovery program, as well as the length of stay has been reduced from 10 days to seven days. So at least you achieving uh, risk reduction by three days approach. This is in general, which I'm sure you can access this kind of uh, paradigm from the Enhanced Recovery Society, where we start early by an aesthetic assessment and avoidance of uh, salt and water overload during surgery and after surgery, and make sure that we establish an early oral nutrition and early supplementation. And one of the very important things that we adapt uh, in all our pancreatic cancer patients. All of them, they will be on pancreatic exocrine uh, enzyme. Uh, replacement therapy, PERP or, or Creon, which is the well-known medicine, Creon. Uh, all of them, they will be seen by a nutritionist before surgery, and they will be given specific advice about vitamin supplements, uh, Creon usage, and uh, energy drink supplements at least three weeks, two to three weeks before surgery. Um, we have shown that 
postoperatively, they develop pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. And more recently, if you've noted in, I think, in the British Journal of Surgery, the Dutch group, they have published uh, their uh, series about pancreatic exocrine insufficiency in post-pancreatic surgery. And they've shown that 96%, I think, have got uh, uh, insufficiency. The problem is how you measure insufficiency. Do you measure it by fecal elastase or do you measure it by uh, asking patient symptoms? Fecal elastase is no good in this case. And this is one of the main criticism for the Dutch group when they measure the fecal elastase. The only way you can prove if they have got pancreatic exocrine insufficiency in these cases is if you do the breath test, which is the 13 CMPG breath test. <clears throat> which uh, your colleagues gastroenterologists can, uh, can do it because these patients they are not deficient of fetal elastase they are the elastase is present but it's not functional the elastase on the mlas need to be functioning when they need the gastric juice and if they don't have that kind of interaction within the duodenum it doesn't function on. and therefore measuring fetal elastase it does not affect pancreatic exocrine insufficiency this is the protocol that we currently use in our uh, hospital for the enhanced recovery program. Um, we don't use epidural, so we stop that completely currently, and we have got a very good outcome by using wound catheters. So wound catheters to infiltrate the wound with bupivacaine for three days, day one, two, three, after day three, the uh, wound catheter will be removed and the patient will be, uh, will be usually kept on uh, paracetamol and maybe non-steroidal if they are starting on uh, diet. If they're not starting on diet, then uh, uh, codeine will be uh, the main pain control at that stage. Right. Now, I'm sure all you are interested to hear whether new adjuvant uh, will help us or not. This is a systematic review that's published in Annals of Royal College of Surgeons, uh, published by my group um, uh, a year, a couple of years ago. And we have proven that the uh, survival actually improves with neoadjuvant therapy. Obviously, this all depends on what studies you have analyzed in the, this meta-analysis. The problem with meta-analysis, if you put Bratton apple in this meta-analysis, you'll get rotten apple at the end result. If you put nice clear apple, you will get a nice clear apples as well. And this is what is my criticism of any meta-analysis. You need to look at the details of underlying studies. Most of these studies are retrospective cohort studies of a single center experience. Today, there isn't a really big neoadjuvant clinical trial that you can ask uh, yourself whether you need to, you can change your practice or anything. There are three trials being published um, and there is another trial which uh, which is the FPAC-5 has not been published. Further trial is recruiting but again uh, we haven't been able to depend on any of these studies to change our practice. Our practice has been built uh, anecdotally now if we have got a borderline disease where we think that we need a vein resection, we will give them neoadjuvant chemotherapy. If we have got a straightforward resectable disease, we will go for resection and give them adjuvant chemotherapy. I hope the day will come when we change that practice because I do believe that the future is going to be for neoadjuvant chemotherapy for all of them. What's important with neoadjuvant approach, there is some evidence that it improves R0 rate. And as you know, this is all going to be an argument. Why is this happening? Is it because these patients, they have got a better disease. They are responding to neoadjuvant approach. They are usually younger and uh, you usually will give them a, a more aggressive uh, surgery and approach. So there are lots of bias. And this is why I'm saying we need really a good, good quality trial before we can let's uh, say this is what we will adapt in the future and we change our practice. This is uh, um, Captain Mayer from the study that I alluded earlier from the Analog of Surgeons. 
um, uh, which is being by, by my uh, fellow, which shows that the neo adjuvant people, they have got a better survival, and this was statistically significant, actually, compared to first surgery first approach from meta-analysis or retrospective studies. What else we have adopted is that intraoperative um, radiotherapy. So whenever now we give a neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we take them to a theater, a special theater, where we've got this machine, which is called the Mobitron external beam machine. And then we give them intraoperative radiotherapy uh, we ask our radiotherapy colleagues to come to theater. So usually we start this kind of surgery by 10 o'clock in the morning. By 12, one o'clock, the radiotherapy um, uh, oncology, radiation oncology will come to theater. We will fix the machine, usually me and them together. And if you can see this, this is the problem again, this is called uh, sort of a, a subjective rather than objective. Because what we feel in our hand during surgery, we think the tumor is there. This is the area that I'm going, what I call it, to zap it or expose it to radiotherapy. There's no way, I don't have a dye or I don't have an instant, uh, for example, a pathologist to tell me that there are cancer cells here to radiate it. So therefore it depends on what's your heart feeling as a surgeon, where is the tumor cells located? And then you bring the machine. What we've proven in this recent publication as we published last year in British Journal of Surgery is that it is safe. And this is what we wanted to prove. We, we haven't got the biggest series in the world. We have got so far 25 cases uh, done with intraoperative radiotherapy. Uh, but we have proven that in our practice, it is safe. And so far, it's the only center in the uh, in UK that we use intraoperative radiotherapy for pancreatic cancer. There is another machine, uh, which is the machine that used for breast cancer, again, which, which is a different, it has got a different physics. I wouldn't be able to explain the difference for you because I'm not a, a radiation oncologist, uh, but my understanding is that the other one has got a little more risk to expose uh, the other tissue, surrounding tissue for radiotherapy. Some centers, and particularly in Korea, I know, that they started to use this approach and currently they are doing the trial. And in the future, we are looking to do this into a trial as well. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have started the, our robotic program. Uh, the problem is uh, obviously, uh, and I would like to share our experience with the robotics sometime in the future uh, when we have got an opportunity. Um, we wouldn't be starting robotic whipples maybe for another six months because you want to build your experience with robotic distals and robotic benign surgery before you can jump on and do whipples. There are some safety issues that we need to tick with the boxes and before our regulator will allow us to do it, but it's been proven um, uh, widely internationally that I think this will be the next uh, development in pancreatic surgery to do a robotic uh, pancreatic organelectomy. The main issue I would say with the robotic is that you need to make sure that you've got a pair of hands with you who's at least at your level, if not better than you, to stand next to the patient. So team approach, couple of people, one experienced surgeon sitting on the console and the other one uh, helping you within uh, on the patients, standing by the patients, to make sure that all the safety uh, parameters has been met. And if there is any bleeding, somebody who will be able to uh, convert to an open procedure within a few seconds and control the bleeding. In general, we know that the, uh, there wouldn't be an improvement in survival, we are unlikely, maybe, but there is at least, it's not inferior uh, to uh, open techniques. And obviously, I hope uh, I didn't take too long from your time. I would love to listen to you and have your thoughts about uh, what is the future of pancreatic, uh, pancreatic cognitive stemia and this procedure. And thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Zaid.
Thank you for the wonderful, concise talk. Let's see if we have uh, any questions from the audience. Please, if you have uh, a question, raise your hand. If you have any question, please raise your hand. It's a question direct to Dr. Zaid Hamadi. Dr. Methat Khafaga. I can't hear you, Dr. Methat. Dr. Methat, unmute, please. Uh, thank you for I... your talk. Thank you. Uh, but do, do you really do the uh, pylorus preserving uh, operation, pancreatic the next to me? Because I observed that it is, uh, it increases the delayed gastric emptying. Yeah. Now I'll tell you my trick with doing it. Yes, I do it. I really, I do it. Uh, my, my trick with it. Yes. Yeah. So my trick with it is that before I do the anastomosis, first of all, I leave only less than a centimeter beyond the pylorus. That's one thing. Secondly, I make sure when I cut the uh, the transection line, you know, the stapler line, I make sure that there is, that I use the cutter so that I see the bleeding. I would like to see the pylorus is bleeding actually nicely, which means it has got a good, plus, because why you get, why you get um, a delayed gastric emptying technically, either there is a lack of blood supply to the pylorus, it gets a little bit tired ischemic, or it gets very tight. The other technique I do, I use a uh, sponge forceps or Riley, and I put it inside the pylorus like this, and I, I damage all the muscles. Now you would ask then, what is the, what is the benefit of doing pylorus preserving? A few of my colleagues, when they see me, they ask me, what's the benefit then of doing it? Actually, where, this, is, this is a pyloromyotomy technique where you, where you damage all the muscles, the damaging of the muscles is not going to be permanent. These muscles will heal later on after the patient started to eat and recovered and there's no leak. 10, 15 days later, usually it takes a couple of months and this will heal. So functionally, the pylorus will come back in a couple of months time after surgery. And this way I do it. And I actually, I can, can tell you that I have never, honestly, I've never had any delayed gastric emptying by doing this technique. So again, I take either sponge forceps or uh, Robert and put it inside the pylorus, open it widely and try to feel that the, I'm damaging the pylorus. And then anastomosis by a single layer interrupted three or PDS or four or PDS, depending on the size of the patient. And I never had an, a single delayed gastric emptying. I can tell you that I had delayed gastric emptying from the normal autos, but not from the pylorus preserving. How about the superpyloric and infrapyloric nodes? You, will you be able to, to remove it very well? No? Yeah, yes, I, I take it with the artery usually, with the gastrodidinal and the, uh, uh, and the gastric artery, so I take it with it. However, however, I don't do it if there is any issue, if I'm thinking that there is a duodenal cancer or ampullary cancer. I do it only for pure pancreatic cancer. Thank so you. If, if, if there is a, yeah, if I agree with you because you don't want to, to sacrifice if it is duodenal cancer. No, I don't do it. I agree. Dr. Mustafa? Yes, Dr. Mustafa Shazli. Uh, thanks uh, for We can't hear you, so to ahish. Your connection, I think, I can't hear you. The connection poor. Uh, connection. Uh, please, Dr. Mustafa Mokin, uh, can you please write the Mr. question Man in the chat? Uh, you can. 
you can hear me now? No, we can. Yes, better. Staccato okay. speech. For how long you keep anticoagulant in case of venous uh, reconstruction? Do you, you do you have to okay. use anticoagulant if you do a portal vein resection? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Mustafa, I'm really grateful for this question. I should have alluded actually to that uh, matter. Yes. Yeah, it's very, very really important. I'll tell you. Uh, so uh, when I do venous resection, Technically, I asked the anesthetist to give 5,000 heparin intravenously instantly in theater. So 5,000 units of heparin while I'm doing the, uh, before I start to cramp the veins, at least a couple of minutes. Then after I do the resection, I would like to see what is, how is the situation? I assess it. In general, in general, after this 5,000, I will only give a prophylactic anticoagulation for four to five days. I don't give anything more. I'll tell you my, my, my approach with it. After they start oral feeding, day five, day six, I start them on 75 milligram of aspirin. Okay? However, this is one thing. This is a, a biochemical approach to stop it from clotting. The main thing is uh, when I do the end-to-end -end anastomosis of the portal vein, I try to leave what we call it a growth factor. I'm not sure if you've done transplantation, liver transplant, and you've noted that. I'm sure some of you would have done. So with liver transplant people, if you noted when they join the portal vein together, they don't tie the proline tight on the vein. They leave about half a centimeter and they leave it loose. So the, the fight or proline, when they tie it, they leave it loose, and I leave it loose. And you can't be scared if you, if you, if, if my assistant is not expert in pancreatic or transplant surgery, they can't be scared. Oh, Zaid, you've left it very loose. It's going to bleed. Blah blah. Don't worry about it. It's not going to leak, to leak, to leak at all. You just, I just leave it loose, and eventually the portal vein will start to expand, and this factor that you left the looseness is going to disappear. I never had any bleeding, any single bleeding from that. Every year I do about 20 cases of pain resection, not even a single bleeding from doing that practice. However, the only time that I had to tie it completely with, with a firmness, I had clotting of the portal vein. That one single time I did it and I had clot of the portal vein. So therefore my, my strategy is 5,000 on table, don't tie it completely, leave, a lo leave it loose, tie it with a proline, but leave it loose. And I can actually record a video, inshallah next time, I will record a video how I leave it loose. So, so I can show you, the, you, you will be, when you see it, oh my God, it's going to bleed, it's going to bleed. It doesn't bleed. I just leave it loose and gradually, gradually you'll see it expanding. I never had any bleeding. But very good question. The only, and I can tell you, Dr. Mustafa, because the only time we used uh, therapeutic anticoagulation straight after surgery, we get bleeding every time we do it. That's not only my experience, my colleagues in the same unit. Every time we use it, I think it's very risky to use a therapeutic anticoagulation at this stage. Just leave it, it will not, it will not uh, clot. It will ne never have clotting. Okay. And then after day six, day seven, I'll use the spring. Okay. Yeah. No, we can't hear you. Please type. If you have any other question, type it in the chat. And please, if anyone has a question, please raise your hand. I so usually, Mustafa says say, he usually yeah. does the same. I agree, I agree, absolutely. I agree. You are not now. You, you, you can hear me, uh, Dr. Hashem? 
I no, think I it's think better we I... can read. Just yeah, type, yeah, exactly. If you type it easier, yeah, I can read it. But who developed what? Yes. Okay. Uh, if you have used aspirin, and they, they so I have I have similar a couple of cases who developed thrombosis few months later, but if they are on aspirin, if they are uh, on aspirin, I would leave them. I wouldn't give them any more than that. And usually at this stage, they have got a chronic occlusion rather than an acute occlusion. They don't usually develop bowel ischemia. You wouldn't worry about bowel ischemia at that stage. After one and a half months. When they are eating and drinking, they are at home. Usually, there will be collaterals. If, although you may not see these collaterals yet on CT scans, but there are collaterals who will be able to. He has caverno. That's exactly. So he has collaterals. So you don't need to worry about it. Because actually, it's functional. There is collaterals and it's functional. I, I would even stop that putting at this stage. You don't need it anymore. Ascites. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that I'm sure his liver is, is being, it's not, his neck is not because of the venous thromboembolism. Uh, I, I would personally, I would get involvement of the hepatologist at this stage, make sure that his liver function is completely optimized, give him some, um, give him some uh, diuretics, uh, spiral lactone, and optimize his liver function. But usually they will be fine. Yeah, even if his liver function fine, because there is, there's some pressure. So his ITs will settle, but just in give him some time. He has got collateral. So functionally, he's okay. Okay. We have another question from uh, Dr. Walid Akmal. Yes. Uh, hello. Hi, Dr. Walid. Yes. Uh, hello, Dr. Hamadi. Thanks a lot for your concise talk. <laughs> Uh, I would like to ask you regarding the intraoperative radiation uh, therapy. Do you implement it after uh, reconstruction or before reconstruction? After reconstruction. So after completely the specimen out, we reconstruct it, and then we, do, we, we deliver it. And this is why I said the series that we published is to prove the safety. We were worried, as you are, I'm sure now, that if yes, we about... give the beam, external beam, it can damage the suture lines. Yes. But after after we've done these cases, we've done 25 cases so far, and none of them has had any problem with bleeding or leak or any problem. Actually, the leak rate is 0% after the intraoperative. And I don't think it's radiation that affects it, but because these patients, they have neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and there is long-standing blockage of the pancreatic duct, almost always their pancreatic duct is huge, and they don't leak. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Okay. We have a question nice question. Mustafa. Do you cover the gastroduodenal regular? Yes, I do. I do cover it regularly. I use uh, a patch. So basically, the uh, falciform ligament patch, I leave it long. And at the end of the uh, procedure, I just tag it above the gastroduodenal, so trying to cover it. And usually, it's nicely covered. And actually, I had to take one patient to back to theater. One of my colleagues, uh, not I'm not defending myself, but it was truly it was one of my colleagues' patients. So he had a leak, and this my colleague used the same technique I do that we cover the artery with the with a patch, and I found the patch completely protecting the artery, hugging like. Hadnal uh, artery, uh, completely protecting it from bank, and it's quite useful. So it's, it's a lesson to me how important you do that procedure. Uh, not, I don't know the outcome. I've, I've read I think a couple of papers they've been published recently about the artery patch, but in terms of my personal experience, I've seen it postoperatively how it protective it, it, it can be. The other question was, if the pancreatic duct is very tiny and it's impossible to connect what you do, I do have one single case in 10 years' time uh, where I couldn't see the duct. I literally, I had a magnifying lens and I couldn't find the duct. Uh, the way I did it, I did it Duncan anastomosis, so very wide uh, 
opening in the jejunum and just uh, complete anastomosis, just without any ductal anastomosis, just dunking. So this is my proceed, uh, approach will be. Do you use continuous irrigation? No, <coughs> I've never, I've never used continuous irrigation. Just leave it mainly. So what you need, I make, I want to make sure if they get pancreatically, two things, get them CT scan, make sure they haven't got any leak which has been undrained. Usually I use two drains in general, but if there is any undrained collection, I will drain it. That's number one. Number two, if they are nutritionally behind, I make sure that they have got a good nutrition, antibiotics, and just wait. Usually, octoriotide, I will start to give it again, but it doesn't work. Believe me, I, 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 and I tell my colleagues, and my, my juniors as well, it doesn't work, but I give it. I give it because I don't have any other things to, to do. <laughs> you know, in my you have to give what you have, but it doesn't work. Uh, and, and you, I have never had a leak which has never settled. So leaks generally, if you if you manage them well, they will settle. It will just make sure nutritionally they are well controlled, TPN, parental nutrition, they can eat, let them eat, make sure they are on very well supported with, with uh, creon and pancreatic enzymes. Um, their diabetes is well controlled and usually they will settle. It takes sometimes it takes time, but it'll settle. Okay, thank you. Do but I never use other questions. <clears throat> Do we have any other questions? Please raise your hand if you have a question. Okay, I think that was it. <laughs> no more questions. Thank you very much. And it's very nice to meet you, Hisham, again. Inshallah, we'll meet you again in Egypt very soon. Are you? Thank Do you have much. any plans to come to Egypt soon? Uh, no, at the moment, I'm waiting for the Royal College. Usually we used to come in March. The Royal College hasn't updated us. At the moment, the exams are all online. But uh, I think from October, there will be revision of the style that we give the FRCS and MRCS. And if they will allow us to travel again, we may come to Egypt in March, next March. Okay. Uh, if you have time, we. I'm always looking for future webinars. So... If you have time in November, maybe we can arrange another talk. Inshallah. Let me know, Inshallah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Inshallah, we, why, why we don't probably, it, although we are an early experience of our robotic program, but it will be nice because I'm sure you would want to know how to start the robotic program as well. And I can yeah. tell you our experience, how we have, we have started and what we are doing now currently and how we are approaching the future in robotic programs. Okay, sure. I will contact you on WhatsApp to arrange. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zaid, and everyone have a good night. Master, Thank you, Master.